history of arbor culture 101 is kind of what I, I figured we'd call it to get started with, but wherever we get started, this is going to be fun. I kind of got my start uh, back in the day, and I'll show you a picture of the company I started working out for. I got 35 plus years, and if I think about when I first started using a chainsaw, uh, it was 41 years ago. So I was very fortunate through my career to work for a company, which I'll mention in a little bit, is uh, to, to blend two things that I'm very passionate about, history and arboriculture. So um, let's get started. Uh, today, uh, some of the resources that I use on a day-to-day -day basis when I discuss um, the history of arbor culture is a couple books I'm going to hold up. Obviously, the first one's in the picture, is, which is arbor culture, the history and development in North America. If you guys really want to get into where we all, our industry came from, this is a phenomenal book uh, for your office library. Um, I believe it's available through ISA. So if you're interested and you want to dig a little deeper than what we talk about, because um, we're, we're going to try to put 100 plus years of history in 45 minutes. So um, this is an amazing um, reference for you. And so is uh, many of you guys maybe have this in there. This is a phenomenal book, uh, Arborist Equipment uh, by uh, Don Blair, who's a good friend and a mentor who helped me uh, through the years to kind of get the... Uh, Historical Society in, um, in print. Great. It's not just about the equipment. Uh, Don did a great job on explaining where the equipment evolved from and who did it. Another great reference on the history of arbor culture. And I use them a lot. And a lot of the references that I'll talk about today are in these books. I uh, do a lot with uh, ISA and TCIA directly uh, whenever I have questions um, there's a couple of great things. Uh, there's a video that came out in 1999 called The Legends of Arbor Culture. It was put together by ISA on their 75th anniversary. We can find that on the ISA store, which is another great uh, video on a rainy day to put up in the, in the workroom so all the guys can see. And then another publication was ISA Memory Lane. So I'll refer to these and a lot of the information that we're going to talk about over the next 45, 50 minutes uh, came from these uh, publications. So any questions on where to get them or if you can't find them, uh, get with me. I'll give you guys my all my information at the end. Uh, another one that doesn't get a lot of credit uh, in the publishing and he helped write some of these books is Dr. Uh, Chadwick from the Ohio State University. Um, very instrumental along with uh, John Davey and Francis Bartlett on documenting Arbor culture in publications for us to view. And I have a lot of Dr. Chadwick's memorabilia and stuff in my office, uh, which I'm sitting in right now. If I was to turn the camera around, we have one of the largest libraries of arbor culture and history of arbor culture um, outside of some of the main big names that you would think of. Uh, another one that you have to thank if you think about what we do today and how we do it is uh, Dr. Alex Shigo. Um, and we have some of his books here also. Again, history of how we take care of trees. Uh, Dr. Alex Shigo, just so you know, is the one that came up with compartmentalization of decay in trees, coded. So you think about some of these forefathers and what they've done for our industry is actually pretty amazing. Uh, some of the reasons to support understanding our history. Uh, I talked to a lot of arborists uh, as the senior tech rep for Arborjet. A lot of you guys know me as Arborjet Joe. I've been with Arborjet almost 20 years. Um, I get an opportunity to talk with a lot of tree care companies throughout North America. And believe it or not, um, understanding our history is very important so we don't uh, follow in some of our uh, in directions that were not successful in the past. So it's important to know that tree care is not new. Actually, uh, taking care of trees as a specimen dates back uh, over 2,000 years. Um, and these facts are all documented in old uh, journals. Uh, and it actually shows us the origins of our basic principles, which, believe it or not, just outside the screen, I'm going to bring in there after we stop sharing screen. And I'm going to show you some of this equipment uh, and some of the historical artifacts that I have and kind of how they came about. So... Well, let's keep on going. Again, we got 100 years to squeeze in. 
Um, let me see. Let me get rid of that. Uh, arboriculture as a science um, really didn't develop until long after horticulture, agriculture, and forestry were well established. And that is documented in uh, one of the books written by John Davy, which we'll kind of talk about. And if you think back into the beginning of time when we're starting to talk about arboriculture, we weren't even using the term arboriculture just yet. So I got MSU Forestry Club because I do a lot of work with them in the nation's oldest established club in 1903. Arboriculture wasn't even a, a, a glimpse or a flash in their eye yet. So it was all traditional forestry with some kind of cool pictures. Uh, the upper right picture is uh, probably in the early days of forestry before automobiles when they actually had horses on campus. So I was very fortunate to have uh, the forestry club donate some pictures. So that brings up a key point. If you think about the history of arboriculture and if you get a chance to read the, or view the legends of arboriculture, before vehicles were readily available, um, the tree surgeons uh, or tree artisans were actually riding around in either bicycles or taking the trolley from job to job. So it was a, it was a big evolution for the automobile. Uh, we won't cover much of that, but just so you guys know that you got to think back way back and what was available and what we had to use at the time. Um, arboriculture developed in a small business with the beginning of the tree research in the 30s. And it kind of ties in, and I know that uh, Davey Bartlett and Ashplant uh, started before that, but it was kind of the, um, one of the very first major tree diseases in the North America that really started arboriculture uh, into small businesses. Um, you know, no, don't not to discredit the guys like John Davey who wrote the book, um, which I got it right here, uh, the tree surgeon in 1902 and uh, Francis Bartlett and Ashblunt and all those guys in the early 1900s. But it really took such a serious invasive disease such as a Dutch elm disease to really kick um, modern arbor culture uh, into a business that we kind of have as we as today. What's kind of neat about that is um, that's kind of what I do, you know, with, with ArborJet is insects and disease management. But um, having something like that and something else in the 30s that really helped uh, to establish small businesses was prohibition. So there was actually and the, the, uh, the Dust Bowl and the crash of the stock market where the government was helping with uh, establishing jobs and careers and then a disease hit and all these hazard trees were there and we needed people to do it. Uh, small businesses were established. A lot of guys and a lot of customers that I deal with, uh, I find it truly amazing that their company that they started, they worked hard, worked hard, and there was something very similar to an insect or disease infestation that really boosted their business. Um, other innovators that you can kind of see in the Legends of Arbor Culture DVD is uh, Chaz F. Irish. Uh, that's, and that's who I worked for back in the day. I was very fortunate to work with the third generation, Chuck Irish. And uh, I'll show you some pictures of some of the artifacts that were actually uh, donated to the Historical Society for us to preserve, to show the world uh, how we got started. Uh, Long Island, John Hickey. Uh, John Hickey's an amazing uh, a man, funny as can be. Uh, Bob McDonald and Bill Lamphere. Uh, Bill Lamphere was uh, Ohio and all these great forefathers of ours are kind of reason why we do what we do today. Here's a little bit of the Chaz F Irish company uh, started in 1910. If you, what's interesting about the Chaz F Irish company is that uh, Chaz Irish was responsible for the change in title. He was the first person to bring arborist and arboriculture as a term to North America. It was being used previously in Europe um, he was the first one to bring it. So what's amazing is that there's some patents that are done by uh, Chaz F. Irish back in the day in the, you know, in the 20s and 30s that we still use today. And one of the coolest things that I have in the museum, if you can see the center picture, if you can see my cursor, um, in front of that old 1920s pickup is a, is a tree mover. 
uh, the Frost Higgins Irish tree cart. That cart right there, that original cart I have in my possession, possession uh, to be put on display as soon as our museum's up and ready uh, for the world to see. That was patented in, I believe, 1917, and I have the original one for display. It's pretty amazing. It is actually as big as a pickup truck, solid iron. Uh, it's amazing at what they built stuff out of back in the day. And another interesting thing that we're going to, you know, after uh, the quick PowerPoint, we get into looking at some of the equipment. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on plant health care, but they also developed uh, a device called the Aero Furt Gun. If you kind of see this picture down here, uh, some of you guys may, re re may remember uh, the predecessor to this, the Grow Gun, uh, but it was another Irish patent uh, for soil fracturing and plant health care. So a lot of cool stuff happened out there in the early days of agriculture. Uh, let's see some of the, you know, events leading up to development of Arbor culture. I think one of the most important things is Arbor day. Um, uh, Morton or Sterling Morton in Nebraska, obviously you realize the value of trees and planting started Arbor day in 1872. So now that we were planting more trees, uh, we had to care for more trees. Uh, and a lot of people were moving from the farm into a more of an urban setting and the, the, Practice practices to maintain those trees have changed, which uh, led to the development of arboriculture as we know it today. What uh, another one of the first major pests introduced? Again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on um, uh, plant healthcare and pests, but you got to go back into the 1870s when gypsy moth uh, was one of the first pests introduced. And I, I wanted to talk about gypsy moth because in the Midwest, if some of you guys uh, were fortunate or should I say unfortunate enough, you've probably seen the explosion of gypsy moth in the Midwest. Uh, I haven't seen Michigan hit this bad from an insect that was ex uh, introduced to the United States in 1868 that I have in my 40 years of my career. So this is how devastating an insect or disease can be when it's brought in. Um, it was said to be thought uh, to be the worst uh, insect infestation uh, in North America, but I think that's old data, and I think uh, Emerald ash borer might have passed that. So always keep an alert uh, as we're going to talk about climbing and climbing equipment. As you guys are out there uh, performing on a daily basis, we always need to be vigilant of looking for something that's just not right. Uh, so we can get a handle on it before it becomes something that 150 years later, we're still trying to, to battle. Uh, a little bit more about gypsy moth. Um, and it's interesting on this because of the history. They used to just scrape them off or pour kerosene on there. You can see that they used to torch them. Um, so a lot of people <laughs> still trying some of those practices, but we kind of evolved. Um, some of the early spray equipment. Obviously, this is pre, we talked about pre-auto. Um, this is a horse and buggy. Uh, this is a hand spray tank. Uh, I'd be curious as to the evolution of the compound that they were spraying in the early days, um, but I'm sure it's not available anymore. Post-word gypsy moth, uh, real quick DDT. Uh, DDT, believe it or not, was actually spread on the troops and saving millions of lives by controlling insects and um, so this is all part of the evolution of arboriculture. Let's keep going. All right, John Davy. So John Davy's book um, that came out, The Tree Doctor in 1902, started putting emphasis on care of individuals' trees. And some of the terms uh, that came out of that book, if you had, uh, we have one in our museum, but if you had the opportunity to read it, it's amazing that some of the terms that came out of that, one of the terms that um, is still used today is uh, butchering a tree. Uh, they used to call it tree butchery. And believe it or not, it was because back in the day before hand saws and chainsaws, um, machetes, not machetes, or a meat cleaver like a butcher would use was actually used for pruning tools. They had a set of chisels and uh, a meat cleaver was the way that they prune branches off. So that's where the term came, don't butcher a tree, because guys were really hacking trees up. 
Um, still, uh, still, you know, we know Davey's still based in Kent, Ohio. And at that time, John Davey came known as the tree man around town. So uh, another practice is uh, brought on by John Davey that some of them we still don't do or we don't do anymore is uh, steel rods. Uh, we do steel rods in certain situations along with cabling, but cavity filling. Uh, the removal of decay, water tubes, and bark tracing. Uh, one of the things that I know that not too many people are doing anymore is um, cavity filling. There was an art to that where they actually would create uh, either looking like bark or they would fill it cement and actually make it look like brick. Um, where our museum is going to be, there is still a tree from the 40s that still has cement in the bottom, as you can see very well. So um, a lot of these practices that were brought out in the early 1900s we through evolution, we've decided we're not, wasn't uh, beneficial to the tree. So they're no longer practiced. Another one is, uh, you know, Francis Bartlett uh, started in 1907. Uh, what's amazing about this and what's going to lead into our discussion in a little bit is one of the first uh, companies start using ropes for climbing. And if you read the Arborist Equipment, there's a great article in there where uh, one climber uh, in his career fell over 100 times pruning trees, which is amazing that he still got up and uh, he still continued to work. Um, so uh, out of necessity, you know, we talked about, um, you know, Bo mentioned in the uh, previous presentation that how his father learned. It was just things passed down over generation and generation. Um, they were climbers uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even into the 70s that never used a rope or never climbed or tied in. So we can thank Francis Bartlett for seeing the, um, the need to have his employees uh, secured safely up in the tree. Uh, hurdles to success. We talked about some of these, obviously, world wars. Uh, when we get into talking about some of the PPE and helmets, uh, we'll talk about world wars, obviously depression, uh, transportation. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, when Kevin, some of you guys in the climbing industry or in the tree care industry know Kevin Bingham. Uh, Kevin and I uh, go way back, even when uh, he started developing some of the, the tools that we use today. Kevin he would drive around the city of Detroit on a bicycle in a in a wheeled trailer tied to his bike to do tree work. So even though that there was transportation available, Kevin still used the old bicycle model. Uh, you, you know, another thing that uh, revolutionized arbor culture was the development of chainsaws. You know, they get into plant healthcare, the sciences, the chemistries, training. Training is huge uh, for us today. You know, not only we we're talking about uh, climbing comps, uh, both Todd and Bo both said what an amazing opportunity was to learn. So training, uh, camaraderie, working with other arborists to see how they do it, to maybe in incorporate into what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the evolution that we pass. And that's what's amazing about this industry that uh, we're so caring and sharing. History of tree care. Obviously, you can see some of the trees on the left, the big one that all the guys stocked in there. That was probably just before they filled that cavity uh, with cement. So they used to have crews that just went out there and filled cavities. Um, the other picture is uh, looking at Dutch elm disease. As you can see, bark tracing was uh, a technique used to try to get the tree, before we even know, knew what compartmentalization was, try to get the tree to wall off that disease. Um, the introduction of some of the tools that we use today. Uh, chainsaws uh, kind of revolutionized what we do. And... The great picture on the right is the is the beginning of some of the stump grinders that uh, started coming out. And believe it or not, the, the stump grinder right here, the bent over model, uh, I was very fortunate that Jim Skier, uh, uh, when he retired, had one and donated it to the museum. So we have something very much like that to show everybody if they ever want to see it. Plant health care days, the spraying of the chemis chemicals. And like I said, we're not going to spend much time because we're we got a lot of cool stuff to show you. We got about a half hour to go. So just looking at some of the ways that we applied compound back in plant health care is just, it's mind boggling. Uh, peak of spring, decline of spring, early days of forestry. This kind of leans into more of what we do. 
um, there's a parallel between forestry and arbor culture that goes way back. Um, I was very fortunate to have some equipment donated me from the city of Chicago forestry department. This goes back to before they, um, before they even had saws that um, they had to fell trees in urban landscapes with axes. So uh, city of Chicago forestry actually donated some of the old uh, artifacts from their archives for the museum, for people to see that, how they did um, urban forestry and agriculture back in the day. So the hand saws, the felling axes, um, I'm not sure how many people still will have an ax on their truck. Um, I don't practice uh, climbing as much as I do, but I do keep an ax in the truck. So that goes back to the, the forefathers and how we started and how we used to take trees down back in the day. I shouldn't say we like it was me, but you know what I mean. All right, let me see. I kind of lost my clicker there for a second. Let me see. Looks like the PowerPoint presentation kind of took a dump on me. Let's go to the next slide. Next. Ongoing research, again, this is kind of what's going to keep us going. Um, I'm not sure why, but let's get, let's get through this and get to some of the cool stuff. Again, new diseases, uh, pencil disease. Let's keep going. Um, you know, what's, what's really spurring the development of the tools and techniques that we do, and again, today is going to be focused on the climbing aspect, is through destructive research, uh, research in the field, um, having guys you know, come up with something. Again, I mentioned Kevin uh, Bingham, but, uh, you know, think about one of the tools that he invented, and him and I were working on this 20-something years ago, where he made it out of wood and had an idea. And he ran with it. Uh, and a lot of guys are climbing on the rope wrench uh, because of Kevin's uh, desire to improve what we do in, on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, let's see what else we got. Uh, what's new in history? Um, a little bit about what we're doing right now. Um, and hopefully I have not had an opportunity to display at the um, Illinois Arbor Association trade show, but maybe by October, um, I'll get with April. Maybe we'll do a display and I'll bring some of the uh, artifacts for you guys to see uh, what we're talking about this afternoon. So um, this is some of the shows and some of the equipment that we got. Um, and this is uh, eventually where uh, the museum is going to be housed in on Belle Isle State Park in Detroit, Michigan, which will be open to the public to see hopefully in the next year or two. And I'll put this back up. This is all my contact information, but I want to get onto the hands-on so I can show you guys some of the equipment and how it evolved. So let's stop sharing. Um, I'm going to go to full screen on me. Uh, hopefully you guys can see um, what I got, but um, I'm going to hold them up in front of the camera. We're going to kind of go over a few things. Uh, the one thing I want to start off with is we're going to kind of start off with uh, what uh, Francis Bartlett developed for us is ropes. Um, uh, there was a chat in the previous section uh, by one a gentleman who uh, had the luxury of starting off in the 70s climbing on manila rope. Now, brand new manila rope was horrible, but as you climbed with it, it softened, you rubbed all those splinters and fibers off. It was actually pretty amazing, held ropes well, and it was a great, great tool uh, for safety. I got a, I got a hemp hunk of this. So if you're not familiar, this is Manila. Uh, this is more of a work line. I don't think anybody would have climbed on it. This is five, eight or three quarter. Um, but this is pretty new. This is still available. Uh, I don't think anybody in arbor culture is using it, but if you ran your hands on it, you can feel the slivers. So what guys would do with this rope is when they first bought it, they would drag it around behind the truck and the dirt out back. So the ground can actually break all these fibers off so they can actually tie it without getting splinters in their hands all the time. So ropes go back hundreds upon hundreds of years. And this is actually the first type of cordage line rope that guys were using in arboriculture back in the day. So when we talk about the evolution and I'm kind of mic'd up so I can be mobile and I'll bring everything back to the screen. Um, 
in the early 80s, uh, companies like Samson and uh, New England started dabbling more and more into forestry and urban forestry. So this is the type of line, one of the first lines that is still available today. Um, it was called True Blue because of the streak in the center core, but a 16 strand designed uh, for arboriculture, um, which kind of revolutionized what we had. So this was actually a nylon line. Um, and there's, there's, there's lots of um, manufacturers and there's lots of different um, products used to construct lines now. So we can talk about a little of them, but what happened was amazing is that it, it's kind of increasing by need. So I have a few other lines. So you can kind of see what happened as we, the, the, the need was there is that more and more manufacturers, more and more different colors, more and more different manufacturers uh, and more and more different types of lines. So if I was to look at what's available now, considering uh, back in the day, you had three options, three eighths, half inch, three quarter, or one. So four options of diameter. You had one rope, a manila rope. You could whatever length you want versus uh, what diameter you wanted. But today, if you look about the choices we have, um, color, length, uh, another thing which is amazing, and, and I show you some of the saddles in a minute, uh, getting a spliced eye put in it right from the manufacturer is huge. Um, single braid, uh, double braid, kern mantle, and then so on and so on. So you can kind of see that from our forefathers, from our working forward, trying to make it safer. And uh, a lot of this has to do with ergonomics, uh, safer for you as an arborist and less shock in your body. Um, a lot of different ropes have been developed. So you have an opportunity to pick whatever you want. All right, so let's move on. I got all these notes down here. I don't want to forget any because there's so many cool stuff to talk about. So next, let's see, I'll put that over there. Let's talk about harnesses. It was really great to see Todd and Bo inspect a harness. So a harness goes back to probably about the 1920s. And what it was back in the day, we talked about the manila rope. Guys were climbing on a double bowl and on a bite. So it could have been a, a Spanish bowl and it could have been just about any type of bowl, but there was a double bowl and on a bite. And how a harness was developed, this goes back to um, Carl Kummerling. So some of, the, some of the old timers may remember that name. Uh, got sick of having to tie it every day. So what they did is they eventually terminated that part of the rope, that tail end of the rope, and kept it intact. Hence, that's where the harness was developed because they got sick of tiring it every day. So they cut it off the end of the rope, spliced it, and every day they would just put their line in the tree and they would tie that back to the harness, hence the harness. So what started off is that if you've ever been on um, a makeshift rope saddle for like wreck climbing or mountain climbing, mountaineering, there's a lot of trauma and suspension and gouging into your legs. So the first couple things uh, developed were different ways to sit in a harness. So here's one of the earliest saddles that I have uh, in the collection. This was donated by Dr. Um, Jim Cobasso at Michigan State University. And what they did um, is they started taking oak staves. So this is part of an oak barrel that they fished their manila rope through. And um, so you would sit in there and you wouldn't get your legs being crushed by the rope. Another thing that's amazing on this is the development, one of the first developments of a bridge. So I don't know if you guys can see this, but they sandwiched two pieces of wood together to keep it spreader. I mean, almost like the, the back in the old days, we used to have a spreader snap on the 4D saddles they were already in the development. And what I thought was really amazing that if you look on the bottom of this, they actually filed notches in here. So once you did either a boat anchor or a termination knot on here, would kept it from sliding from side to side. So this is an early saddle, uh, Manila. Someone had actually taken a belt. You got some tool clips on there. And uh, 
you guys may not be able to see, but um, there's something a little treat hanging off this belt. And some of the old guys will remember exactly what that is. That's a paint can. So back in the day, we thought that every pruning cut that had to be made had to be sealed with some type of tar. And that's one of the original Carl Kummerling paint cans. So you can kind of see from a rope to guys were thinking, uh, due to pain and injury, what do we got to do to make it a little bit easier? Um, so what happened is that uh, with Carl Kummerling, they took the rope and they started commercially producing saddles, which came out like so. So this is a Kummerling saddle. And these are your tie-in points. This would be tied in now that you cut your line. This is your tie-in point. If you look at it, the purpose of what we're climbing on today is very similar to what they're doing now. And if you look how they isolated the legs and how they made it so movable that you can move your legs and straddle branches in your tie-in point, it's not much different than what we do in other than materials. So this is probably the 1950s technology right there. Very, very cool. And then um, during the depression, I have this, uh, a saddle that was donated by um, an arborist, uh, Don Trong from Ohio. Guys were actually making their own. So if you look at this, he had enough craftsmanship to design this, riveted all the working tools in there, spliced his own eyes in there, and he created his own saddle. And believe it or not, this was in production. This wasn't in production. It was a private guy who made it himself, which leads into some of the topics of how some of the manufacturers for the 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 harnesses or saddles, hence the word saddle, because um, companies like Weaver and Buckingham were technically making tack for horses uh, before they started constructing climbing equipment. So another beautiful example of uh, the history and what guys were doing back in the day. Um, and as uh, things evolved, uh, we tried a lot of things. And uh, I got an example, one of the newest saddles that just came in Uh, this is by Buckingham, their new saddle, but different manufacturing. So technically, it's almost the same. It's how you suspend yourself. It's how you're secured, but with different materials, uh, more nylon, more webbing, uh, aluminum, uh, changing the light, the weight. But the sad to believe that if you took this saddle and weighed it to this this is still heavier than what they used to climb on back in the day. So when it comes to weight, we talk about competitions. Um, Todd had mentioned about uh, that one climber that stepped in uh, to an event with everything he owned on his belt. Um, I'm at that point in my climbing career that I'm taking everything off my belt possibly needed. And I'll, if I got to pull something up, I'll pull something up. So, but it's amazing that even with all the new technology, the weight is all about the same. And like uh, the ropes, there's so many options out there. And um, it comes down to uh, what you're going to do for on a day-to-day -day basis and comfort. Um, I'm looking for some because I'm a little bit stocky or top heavy. I feel like I'm going to flip over in my saddle all the time. Might be the way I'm tying in or something. But um, finding a comfortable saddle that you're going to sit in all day long is very important. And now today, through the evolution and the painstaking advancements that our forefathers did, we got lots and lots and lots of or options uh, for it. So, all right, that's harnesses and saddles. Let's see what else. Um, ergonomics, custom fit. I even thought about, um, because I, I can't sleep at night, fitting a saddle. How do you fit a saddle in today's day and age? And I thought about some of you guys may have a teeter hang up where you hang upside down, finding your center of balance um, so you can find a saddle that kind of works with your center of balance so you're not fighting yourself as you ascend in the tree. So we have to be 
uh, smarter, work smarter, not harder. Okay, so that's ropes and harnesses. So let's start with some of the advancements of the climbers in PPE. And um, we'll start at the top. We'll start off protecting our wheelhouse. Uh, Todd had mentioned uh, showing up in the early days at a competition and, oh my God, where's my hard hat? Shoot, because it was, it was hard to get people to wear them. And I still see uh, companies out there on drive-bys or pulling up on a job that there's no PPE gear on. So I'm not the PPE gear police. Um, I just recommended that your life's worth it. Make sure you're wearing it, make sure your team's wearing it um, and make it available. So one of the, the beginning of hard hats in our industry goes back to right after World War I, um, E.D. Bullard. Bullard is still a, a helmet manufacturer. Uh, started with a helmet in 1919, made a canvas. And you're like, canvas? But it was shellacked with a boiled linseed oil. And what happened is when it dried, it created a real hard, rigid um, helmet that guys were wearing. And it would look similar to this. So here's a bullard hand helmet. Now, what's, I wanted to show you this one first because... The, the form does look like a World War II military helmet. It's a wide brim all the way around. Now, when I was active, um, I wore a wide brim, but I wore one out of, that was plastic. Uh, because a lot of times when I was in the industry, uh, this is not ANSI rated metal energy clearance. So a right helmet, right spot. This is patented in 1945. This is one of the original patent pending helmets. So... Notice the shape, the aluminum. Foresters or loggers still wear this hel helmet today. Very light uh, and a lot of protection. So what we have now is you can still get that helmet in a today's version. So I wear this one out of tradition. The nice thing about this is the suspension. We talked kind of about uh, when you're inspecting your helmet, you got a life cycle, making sure your suspension's tight, firm, adjustable. So you can still get this helmet. Again, aluminum, can't use it around energy clearance, but I like it out of tradition. So helmets have been around and protecting yourself. And again, there's so many manufacturers out there. So climbing, uh, again, we don't need a name by name. You just know by looking at it. So now they're all becoming incorporated. I love the fact that they're vented. Uh, I got my GoPro mount on there. Um, Hearing protection, it's a lot of things we still don't force enough to guys wear hearing protection. So we're kind of evolving into a helmet that has everything. And then recently, you know, then you can get in there and you can keep moving on to what you guys want. You can kind of get one that's got everything and even a mess screen. So depending on what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, the evolution of safety for your melon has really advanced. Um, What's great about some of these new helmets is that they're pre-wired to handle a lot of the communications between yourself and the ground, which um, if you've been in the industry for a while, it was just yelling down out of the tree. Um, and uh, <laughs> 35 years ago when I was practicing, there was a lot of cuss words and you didn't realize how far they reverberated across the neighborhood. So as the industry is kind of cleaning up and <laughs> we're trying to be more professional, um, the the, I, I, the intercom between your ground guy and yourself and your crew, having that already built into your headset is actually, uh, it's amazing. So if you're not using it, look into that. So hearing protection saddle. So let's work our way down. Let's see where we're at. We still got about 15 minutes. Um, let's get into clothing. You know, a lot of guys don't um, appreciate the advancement in what we wear on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when I first started, you wore Levi's, you wore whatever you could and you had Levi's you worked in, you had Levi's you didn't because you're going to wreck them and they didn't last very long and they weren't very comfortable to climb in because now that we know with all the extra support and a stretch and give, um, now we know what a true climbing pant or a good work pant is. When I was in 35 years ago, uh, Carhartt kind of came into the business with something a little bit more rugged. But if you guys ever tried to climb or bend over in a pair of Carhartt 
pants. They're rigid. They're tough. They're restrictive. So a lot of credit needs to go to companies like Arborware, where Arborware uh, came out with the first true line of clothing and pants that were developed and designed for a climber in, in mind. And it's the, we looked at the, the climbing harnesses, the saddles, where you had to be able to spread your legs and reach over to another lead, a branch. Uh, back in the day, a lot of the clothing that we wore restricted that. So thanks to Arborware for that. And not only the design, but the fabric. Uh, a lot of the clothing that we wear now, because uh, it's a pretty intensive uh, activity, is the sweat in the, in the wicking away in the dry shirts. So we have a lot of new um, technology, even in the clothes that we wear. Before it was just a t-shirt and a ball cap. Um, if you look back to some of the trees that I climbed back in the day, um, it's had a ball cap on and a t-shirt, but now we have a lot of stuff that's a lot more protective and comfortable to wear. And high vis, you can't miss me. So that's important, uh, especially in a crew, um, to be able to see where your ground guy is or be able to spot your, our, your climber up in the tree. So now we have high vis. Um, all this great stuff, flexible, breathable clothing that we wear on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, that was a pretty good evolution. I kind of like it. And plus it looks good. A lot of stuff looks pretty good. There's a lot of designs. Um, next, uh, as we work down the shirts is we talked about jeans You know, we talked about pants. We talked about um, protection. Now you got to think that when things evolved in the, um, after World War II, when we started getting into uh, chainsaws became more and more readily available and more and more popular. Different types of injuries were happening. Um, at first, uh, men would start using leather chaps because there was that was what we had available. Um, and then science came up with compounds, and then we started having chaps uh, similar to these. And these babies are dirty and old, but we started developing compound or fibers that could stop that saw before they caused injury. So injury was pushing the development of safety, PPE. How do we keep this stuff safe? How do we, how do we save ourselves? So it kind of pushed us into developing that. Now, if you look into uh, what we have available today, as we kind of went through leather chaps, jeans, car hards, uh, buckle on chaps, which whatever way you want to do it, as long as they're ANSI standard and OSHA approved, I'm all for it. But now today, we've incorporated the pant and the material for his chainsaw protection, which is actually pretty amazing. Um, if you look about, you know, a lot of times we follow what happens in Europe. In Europe, I know that uh, it's mandatory to climbers to have saw pants on. Uh, I know it's probably coming here. Maybe some places already recommend it, but we now have... Uh, the PPE to protect ourselves even while we're climbing. So that's an evolution from nothing to what we got today. Let's see, feet. Oh my God, this is a, this is a topic. If you look at um, what we talk about on a lot of the chats um, in regards to uh, PPE is what kind of boots do you like? Uh, when I started, uh, the biggest thing for us to think about is uh, do we wear, do we want steel toe or not? Um, and what kind of socks were you wearing? Because you're on your feet all day. Uh, when I got into the business 35, 40 years ago, uh, logger boots, logger boots were big uh, in the tree industry. And if you ever had to put a spikes on gaffs, hooks, whatever you want to call them, you had a nice big heel there to kind of hold that in place. Um, so that's evolving. So that moved. So I got a couple of samples of what's going on now. So if you think about this was a, a donation uh, came out of the MSU Forestry's office. So here's a climbing boot. Uh, they even had them back at the point where if you look at the bottom of this, they had caulks on there. So you can kind of see that this gouging right here where this guy probably had spurs in us erected. But do you want traction in the woods or on the logs or not? So this baby is heavy, steel toe, probably weighs five pounds per boot. 
Now, with your socks on, all your gear on, again, you're just adding weight and fatigue on your body. So this is probably 60s, 70s, um, into the 80s. And then, you know what? Don't get me wrong. If you still like your, your logger boots, more power to you. Um, I still have a pair, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, I, I'll put them on. But today, a lot of guys are going into um, a boot that actually is designed for what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. This thing is light as a feather. So again, we're trying to restrict the weight, evolution, wear and tear on our bodies, evolved in actually someone designing something for our feet for what we do today. Pretty cool. Um, and again, you get to a certain point in, in your year, your mid to late fifties, you're trying to lighten up everything um, as much as possible to eliminate um, fatigues. And one thing I know that's not, no flip-flops, no tennis shoes. I couldn't tell you how many times I see guys do running a saw in sneakers. Um, we just have to be diligent to make sure that no matter what we're doing, they have as much protection as possible. Safety, safety, safety. So now we're going to talk about shoes. So let's see. I got a few more notes. We've got a couple more minutes. I'm going to check and see if we got any Nope, no questions. Um, one of the things that I noticed today when I was prepping for today's presentation is that one, it's really hard to cover because I could have went in so many directions. We didn't get a chance to talk about friction hitches. Uh, I learned on the taunt line, then it was taught the Blakes. Um, I can go to a trade show now and ask anybody if they know how to tie those. And most guys don't. Um, and the argument is, and I just talked to a, a, a a very well-known climber in Michigan that competes and he's amazing. And he told me, he says, why do I need to know that? And I'm kind of like, why wouldn't you want to know it? So uh, again, friction hitches, you know, we talked about Kevin and the, the advancement of how we um, uh, control our descent or even our ascent has changed so much in all the books that I talk to you. Uh, the most current one on the history of arboricultures is 1999. Think about the next, last 20 years of evolution of what we do in our industry. Um, and there's still, there's still room for advancement. There's still, there's still things that we can be doing out there. Um, like I said, the rope wrench, the friction hitches, climbing techniques alone. Um, so all this is um, where we're going uh, to be safer. Uh, foot ascenders. Oh my God. I wish I had a foot ascender back 30 years ago. Foot ascenders now using the biggest muscle in your leg to ascend up into a tree is actually amazing. On the proper cordage or line is all absolutely incredible. Um, another great thing is that safety protocols. You think about ANSI standards and best management practices to help um, the guys we're talking about reading the rule books, reading these BMPs and ANSI standards on what we do today could actually really save somebody. And a lot of those were drafted over the last 20 years or updated over the last 20 years. So if you don't have a an up-to-date copy of those, grab it. Um, it may save someone's life. Um, safety. Um, and I'll end with, it's uh, we got five minutes till we close to answer a few questions. I think I've seen a couple pop up, but um, you know, the most important part of what we do is safety. You know, stay safe. Um, and when in doubt, just ask, you know, get an opportunity to, um, to look at the videos of how these guys did it in the heyday. You're going to you know, appreciate what you got going on now. Uh, another thing that was kind of funny is we talked about, um, I asked somebody if they brought a ball cart the other day and he looked at me like I was like, I was like, what? And I says, a ball cart, you got your ball cart with you. Cause we had some logs to roll out of the backyard. He's like, what is a ball cart? And he's been in the industry 10 or 15 years. I didn't know I was that dated. But we used to have to drag logs out of the backyard with a ball cart. So things are changing and they're changing for the better and they're saving people's bodies. Uh, my body shot after 30 years of climbing. Um, I still wreck climb and I do what I can, but I'm climbing on the advancements of technology and how this industry is evolving. So I'll check for a couple questions. Uh, we got a couple minutes left. Let's see. I think I see one pop up and then uh, we'll get you guys uh, back on the road. Um, 
is the Arboriculture Museum to be on Belle Isle incorporated with the sawmill restoration? Yes. Um, we are in the process of the restoration right now. The library and the offices are in Marlette, Michigan, which is up in the thumb. But yes, the plan is to restore that sawmill and the building adjacent to it to have a museum open to the public on specific arboriculture. I've been looking uh, all around for five, six years now as we've been doing the restoration. There is no muse museum of arboriculture open to the public. Now, Davy and Bartlett have great archives, but it's not set up in a museum form. And I believe that there is discussion to maybe having it, but I'm not sure how accessible to the public it's going to be. But yes, uh, Belle Isle is now a state park on, in Michigan. And we chose that location due to the fact that that island, that state park, has an average attendance on that island of four to five million visitors a year. So that gives the Arboriculture Historical Society an opportunity to reach four to five million people annually on what you and I do for a living. So it's a pretty worthwhile endeavor. And if you guys are digging around and you guys have been in the industry a long time and you find something that's really cool that we can incorporate into history of Arboriculture presentation like this, please uh, reach out to me, give me a call. Um, I know um, Russo's is a sponsor. Dan O'Brien can get you my contact information if you need it. But let's uh, let's do what we can to preserve uh, the industry that we love so much.